weekly um, sort of event newsletter of all the things that we have coming up for a given week. So I'm actually going to introduce our speaker today, um, but I'm just delighted to do that. Um, Jacob is actually a former Lossies major, so he was one of my advisees for a few years, and we've kept in touch the last few years. And he always comes and stops in to visit us in our office whenever he's in town, so I always enjoy that. So. Um, I had written some notes, but then I found today actually on his website, he has a really nice bio that he wrote about himself, so it's actually better than what I put together, so I'm going to read a little, give you a little background about Jacob. He's an investigative journalist, um, currently based in Kenya, um, and, and the Caribbean, from time to time, correct? He reports on develop, development economics and inequality, foreign aid and investment, governance and innovation in developing nations. He's originally from Milwaukee, and he graduated from UW-Madison with his BA in Lassies and also journalism um, in 2000, 2010. After that, he spent two years reporting from Haiti and the Dominican Republic, where his work focused on immigration, politics, and post-Earth aid. In 2013, Jacob received his Master's in Political Journalism from Columbia University in New York. There, he investigated Chinese engagement in Africa and authored an award-winning e-book, China's Congo Plan, which actually I read because he sent it to us. It was really fa fascinating. So if you're interested in that, you can, you can like a link on his website to it. Um, Jacob was a 2013 Overseas Press Club Fellow for the Associated Press in Nairobi, during which time he covered the Westgate Mall terrorist attack for the agency. He speaks fluent Spanish, conversational Haitian Creole, and basic French. His journalism has appeared in such media as The New Yorker, Foreign Policy, The Associated Press, Newsweek, Ground Truth, Ozzy, the American Interest, Wernicke Magazine, the Christian Science Monitor, the Center for Public Integrity, and Jazz Times Magazine. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jacob. Thanks. Thanks a lot for coming today. Thanks a lot for having me. You're um, so yeah, I mean, as Sarah mentioned, I would, I'll just briefly, you mentioned my, my trajectory. Um, I, yeah, I'm from uh, Milwaukee, went to high school in Shored, uh, Shored High School, got involved with the newspaper there. So I've always been doing journalism for a long time, was intent on doing that here in Madison. Um, and basically what kind of changed, uh, I mean, I'll get to this if people stick around, I'm doing uh, just a discussion later about anyone interested in careers abroad, especially in reporting, so we can talk about that more. But um, what really kind of changed everything was when I studied abroad. Early on, when I was a sophomore, actually, I, I studied abroad in the Dominican Republic, which is what started my whole interest in, in living and working abroad and in journalism. And it was as soon as I got back from that that I got involved with Lassies here, you know, came in, met Sarah and everybody else. And, and it was just a, a really great experience through the rest of the, my college uh, term here, um, you know, taking courses affiliated with the Lassies department and, and being a part, coming to these talks. So I, I do really want to thank Lassies for doing such a good job of, um, you know, in honing this sort of interest, at least I had, and I assume that that happens for many other people, this interest in going abroad, um, working abroad, that sort of thing. Um, so thank you guys very much for your work doing that. Um, um, yeah, so I, before I start, I just want to get a sense of, of, of who's here really briefly. Um, so how many people are students currently? Okay. Uh, what departments or what majors if you have? Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and and those who those who aren't students, um, are you are you affiliated with the university? I'm just curious to get a sense of, or, or those who are also teaching in addition to being students, uh, what sorts of things are you working on, uh, or, or you know what sorts of departments are you affiliated with, or anyone from outside the university? I'm just trying to get a sense of who's here. So, um, interested observers. Okay, that's right. Has anyone been to the Dominican Republic or Haiti? Anyone who's been to the Dominican Republic, raise your hand. Okay, so why were folks in the Dominican Republic, just briefly? Vacation, research, anything, yeah? Research. Okay. Land tenure. Land tenure, oh, perfect. I'm gonna talk about land tenure and, and the other side, actually, Haiti. Okay, I'll be interested to hear your thoughts. Uh, Haiti, land tenure. Oh, perfect, perfect. Uh, anyone else who's been in the Dominican Republic? Yeah? From what part? Perfect, cool, great. Uh, anyone else? Uh, and San Domingo as well. Great. Cool. Cool. Uh, okay. All right. And what about Haiti? Yeah? Okay. Very cool. Uh, what part? Of Haiti? Great. 
great. Anyone else? Been to Haiti? Uh, yeah? Amanda, great. Good to meet you. Um, yeah, working and vacation. Cool. Great. Anyone else? All right, well, so I'd love it. I, I, I'm hoping this is really just a discussion uh, for the most part, so please, um, questions, comments, everything as I go, just please let in, especially folks who are familiar either through research or through visiting either of the countries. Um, please, but in at any time, I really would, would love to have that interaction. Um, so I want to start with Haiti. I'm just going to talk a little bit about Haiti. This is actually a, a border market, um, at one of the border crossings between the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Twice a week, the border opens and people rush back and forth with everything you can think of from you know, food products to, to plastics to, to everything. It's a fascinating part of the island because it's, it's the sort of one place where you have this interaction between the two peoples every day. I've spent a lot of time in border areas like this. This one's at Himani, uh, which is one of the main border crossings. Um, but I'm actually going to start talking first about the Haiti side. Um, and so just to catch us up on where Haiti is, just broadly, right? There was a, 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 I have to go through this pretty quickly, but earthquake 2010, January 2010. It's been five years since then, since that earthquake. Um, there's been a lot of political concerns for a long time, obviously, in Haiti, and maybe you're familiar with some, but I'm just going to keep it to modern history, very recent history, and, and talk about where we are today in Haiti in terms of the politics. So um, we have a president uh, whose name is Michel Martelly, who has been in office uh, for almost five years now. Um, and elections haven't been held in so long, parliamentary elections, no sort of elections have been held in so long that there is no legislative branch currently in Haiti. All their terms have expired. Haiti is de facto kind of an authoritarian state right now, again, uh, in the sense that um, there haven't been elections, so there aren't enough people in parliament right now uh, to pass any laws. So it's a very dire political crisis, once again, actually, in Haiti. And so elections are finally been scheduled for end of August and end of October. And so this fall will be an interesting time to, to follow Haiti news and kind of see what's going on there and, and who people are looking for in terms of a new leader and in terms of new political uh, representatives and that sort of thing. Um, but for now, things, you know, if you think things move slowly in Haiti in general in terms of progress, the government, uh, right now it's stagnant completely because there is no functioning government, or no functioning legislative branch at the moment. Um, uh, it expired in January. The terms of enough members expired in January that they can't operate, uh, they can't uh, have a majority vote on anything. Um, so that's kind of, I mean, I mean, we'll get into the history and I'm happy to take more questions kind of looking at the background of Haiti. Um, uh, so please ask if you have other questions, but I'll, I'll let that come up as we go rather than just spend a whole lot of time on the history, I think. Um, and if we don't touch it, at the end, I'll touch on a little of the historical factors. So um, I thought I'd schedule, like, you know, structure the ha talking about Haiti based on what Haiti's current leaders hope for it in the future. So their current development plans, um, which, which revolve around a few different industries and areas. Um, and I'm going to focus on, on the three, well, maybe all four, um, mining, tourism, and manufacturing, and maybe we'll get to agriculture, although unfortunately that hasn't been as much of a focus of the government as I think uh, people would like it to be. But um, so, uh, you know, so the question is, you know, Haiti, I mean, we can talk about how Haiti got to be what it is, but I think an important question that everyone's talking about is how is Haiti going to get out of what it, you know, the, the, the sort of um, levels of poverty it has now, the political crises that kind of be, are reoccurring, and so, the areas that the first area that I want to talk about that Haiti's own government has has said this is a focus for us in terms of something that's going to bring us out of poverty, uh, and what's next is mining. So I'll go through mining, and then we'll talk about some other industries and, and kind of ask the question: Is this going to help? You know, is this going to be something that allows Haiti to help sustain itself better than it is currently? Um, so mining, um, the first. Um, Miners in the, on the island were indigenous, uh, and then Christopher Columbus arrived, there was some gold mining going on. Um, there hasn't been a lot of gold mining in particular since until recently. So there's a handful of U.S. and Canadian companies that have been for eh, 10 years now, some of them, um, searching for gold. So the exploration process of opening a mine, you're testing soil, you're looking at uh, geological maps, trying to decide, okay, could there be a bunch of gold and other minerals buried here? So um, there's, there's, there's lots of companies searching in the mountains, as of recently anyways, um, looking for gold and other minerals that they could eventually open a mine on. So that's, you know, Haiti is looking at examples of other countries that are very dependent on mining. Obviously those familiar with Latin America will know plenty of countries that were mining is a huge uh, industry 
Um, and so Haitians can actually look even just next door to the Dominican Republic as a place that's quickly uh, increasing its mining production. Just a few years ago, a very large gold mine opened in the Dominican Republic, uh, owned by, co-owned by Barrick and Gold Corp. And so, um, you know, it's known that there's, there's, there's good mineral deposits on the whole island. is isn't known exactly where all those are yet. People are exploring, but, but um, as of now, the Dominican economy is actually changing rapidly because of the mining revenue. So, you know, if you're in Haiti, uh, you're looking and saying, hey, you know, we need sources of revenue, we need employment, we need all these things, you know, mining kind of becomes an attractive thing. You're literally pulling out dollar in money from the earth, uh, you know, value from the earth. Um, so a lot of interest in that. Um, I reported on this back in 2011. I spent about nine months doing a uh, report about how these companies were searching for gold and at the same time, how some of these companies were pressuring Haiti's government to change its mining laws to make them more favorable to the companies in order, you know, if they open a mine someday, they want the lowest possible tax rate, that sort of thing. So I got to see some of this uh, happening, and, and, and shortly after I finished that project, the World Bank stepped in and said, hey, we're going to help Haiti to redo its mining laws. I mean, the mining laws haven't been updated since 1960-something, 1981, um, I think. And so, um, so as we speak, the World Bank is working with Haiti's government, trying to develop a proposal to you know, essentially outline what a company has to do to open a mine, how much money has to go to the Haitian state, the Haitian people, the local governments. So, so you know, if mines open, this will all be very important. Um, but among the provisions that some of Haiti's leaders want in this new mining law are a 15-year tax break for mining companies. So uh, no one benefits from revenue for 15 years. Uh, other things include um, the ability to keep mining uh, exploration concessions secret for 10 years, so, so that no one would know where companies are even looking for minerals, which is also very concerning, um, especially to the people who live on the land where these companies will be looking for minerals. Um, and so, you know, I, I spend time, you know, visiting communities, areas where there's artisanal mining going on, you know, people with shovels digging, digging up dirt, you know, entire communities every day, you know, digging and washing out dirt by the river, looking for tiny pieces of gold to sell in the black market. I mean, that stuff has gone on, but the question is, you know, what's going to happen when large companies kind of come in there? And, and you just have to be a little bit concerned based on other land appropriations that have happened in Haiti and other sectors. So um, luckily, there are, there are people paying attention to this issue. So there's the New York University like, uh, Law School. They have a group of people who are doing a lot of research into um, the rights of peasant, the rights of farmers and, and people living on this land. Um, just in... January, um, a group of Haitian farmers who are on you know, mineral-rich land filed a complaint to the World Bank saying that they've been excluded from this process of discussing, you know, are we, um, you know, you know, are we entitled to know who's searching on our land, what they're searching for, what the benefits will be for us in the future, possibly what would the risks be? And, and so there's, there's actually a, a complaint being filed against the World Bank for facilitating these governmental meetings and, and legislative meetings um, without involving the people who it's going to affect. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. Um, yeah, if you read the, if you follow Clinton news, um, Hillary just came out that, that, that Hillary's brother has a big stake in, in mines. And so if you know anything about Haiti, we'll get more to this later, but the, Bill and Hillary have both been very involved in Haiti in all sorts of capacities for, for decades now. And we're, so we're getting to that, but now there's accusations that there might have been favoritism um, in terms of getting mining, getting permits to search for gold to the company that Hillary's brother is uh, on the board of, actually. So we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, the, the question, right? Will mining, you know, save Haiti? Will revenue, will, will mines open up in the next 10 years? Will this be, generate tons of revenue? I think mining, if done right, could be uh, an important part of improving Haiti, actually. I really do. Uh, and that's having, I've even studied El Salvador a little bit, where there's kind of this allegedly <laughs> uh, uh, de facto uh, uh, ban on mining. Um, and, and so I, I understand the risks a lot. I've reported on mining a lot all over the world. Um, and I think, I think there's a lot of potential. But if you, again, if you have a government that can't negotiate well for itself, can't negotiate good rates on the royalties and everything from the mine, and then can't, once collecting that money, can't dis, you know, isn't good at dispersing it to its people and helping bring people out of poverty, then I think mining will do more harm than good. And so there's a lot of, 
I think is an important thing to be paying attention to in, in the coming months, what sorts of legislation comes out of, um, there's you know, these new mining laws that the World Bank is heavily involved in. Um, so I, that might not be a very satisfying, I don't have a satisfying conclusion, but I'd love to hear if like, people have any experiences to share elsewhere in Latin America. Has anyone researched mining, studied mining, come from places where there's mining in Latin America? And I'm just curious to know like, what sorts of concerns you know, you guys came across in those places or what sorts of interesting debates are going on regarding to like mineral wealth and mining elsewhere. I mean, if anyone has anything to share, I'd love to hear um, your thoughts on that or much less on Haiti. Yeah. Well, I actually worked for mining companies. Oh, okay. I was in school. Um, I was an executive assistant at a mining company, an Australian company, and I was working on uh -huh. Yeah. But I was really struck by, you know, granted I worked in an office with a mix of administrative, you know, sort of higher ups and then also um, some of the geologists that actually went and worked out oh. around to the results of the scientific stuff going in the office. It was kind of interesting, but the, the level of wealth of these people was just astounding. Yeah. Yeah. I've met some people like that too. I met a guy on the top of a mountain who has had some sort of drill or equipment that no one else had in Haiti, and so he gets paid thousands upon thousands of dollars a day to go let rent his out when like a company's own equipment breaks, and just run into this guy literally on the top of a mountain. Uh, and so I've met that kind of character. You know, it's easy, but it's. I think often, you know, when we know, you know, the sorts of things that happen in mining, it's easy to, you know, kind of condemn that and say, you know, it's likely to do more harm than good. But when you're, when you're, a, you know, a Haitian, I imagine, you know, like the question that people I know there ask is, you know, well, well, we need something, you know. I mean, it's easy for people to say, oh, mining could be bad. It's like, well, we don't have jobs, we don't have anything, you know, give us something. And so I think that we really. I think often people kind of dismiss mining a little too quickly if you were to talk to people in these areas who say, yeah, we want mining, we just want to benefit from it, right? Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. I don't know if there's any other comments on, yeah, go ahead. That happened in the Dominican Republic too. There was a briefly operating gold mine uh, 40 years ago uh, that was then taken over by the state. The state neglected it. It polluted the local waters. And, and today you can go in the Dominican Republic and find these rivers that are just bleach, or not bleach red, I don't know what the term would be, but like very, very red rivers based on some iron deposits that, you know, the effect of mining that happened 40 years ago that actually the current company, Barrick, is charged with cleaning up even though they didn't, they didn't make them as a part of the deal is they have to clean that up. Um, but yeah, I mean, I saw that in the, even in the Dominican Republic, you know, people who lived on fishing in the river and all the fish died, all that sort of thing. That's very, that's very common. So you saw that in Bolivia. Okay. Um, also, also in the Colombia, so I, I, I used to go there and do mm -hmm. well. Yeah, they, the people used to make, scrape out a living, they've been mining for time and memorial. But then an American company came in, Joseph Pacifico came in there, mm -hmm. and uh, they polluted the water. But not only that, they, you know, they drag those rivers, you know, it's not it's just sort of like taking what you call sustainable mining yeah. or anything like that. It's just a complete raiding of the land. And then the people go